Good afternoon. It's uh, 3 o'clock. I think we have a couple people uh, tuned in. My name is Kevin Elmas. I'm a court commissioner for Yakima County District Court. As part of my uh, responsibilities as a uh, court commissioner, I uh, do hear most of the civil cases that are filed in our county court. That would include small claims cases. Uh, what I want to do this afternoon is just give an overview of the uh, process, how small claims cases are filed and uh, heard in our court. I uh, will give the usual disclaimer. I can't uh, discuss specific uh, facts or uh, cases that might uh, come before me, but uh, again, a general overview of how the process works. So here's some more people joining. Again, my name is Kevin Elmas, I'm Court Commissioner. I am a, a judicial officer that is appointed by the elected judges in our court. And with that, uh, I'll get started with uh, the process. Small claims cases, uh, as the uh, title uh, might suggest, involve small amounts of money, uh, uh, money that is at uh, issue. Currently under the uh, statutes in the state of Washington, a person bringing a small claims action is limited to a statutory maximum of $10,000 per claim. Uh, any other party, including corporations or partnerships, are limited to claims of up to $5,000. The intent, uh, the purpose of the small claims process is an informal, uh, quicker resolution of uh, claims in those amounts, a uh, quicker process than uh, what you would encounter in regular civil actions, civil lawsuits, either in district court or in superior court. The process is begun with our civil department. There is uh, fortunately a, a form uh, that uh, parties uh, can work with in describing what their claim is, uh, who the parties are, and then the plaintiff, the person bringing the claim, will sign that document with our civil uh, staff in district court. We're on the second floor, by the way, if you're not familiar with our uh, location of the Yakima County Courthouse. There is a filing fee for small claims actions. Currently it is uh, $50, and there are a couple components to that filing fee. One is the actual fee and there is a, uh, an addition to that to fund our Dispute Resolution Center. And they will become involved, uh, as I'll describe here in a few minutes. The claim, again, is filed, and then the civil staff will provide a court date and time for the first step after filing. That is a mediation hearing. Now, the plaintiff person bringing the claim is responsible for serving, providing notice of that claim and the court date to the defendant. So the uh, expense beyond the $50 that is paid to the court would be the cost of service in most cases. Most of the people who bring actions in our court use the Sheriff's Department. The Sheriff's Department has a civil department a deputy who serves legal papers and a small claims action would uh, would constitute that. They uh, charge a fee for that that uh, varies depending on how many attempts they have to uh, make to actually serve to place the documents with the uh, defendant uh, and mileage that all goes into that. I have noticed uh, recent uh, years that uh, cost of service uh, varies from 40 uh, to uh, $70, most uh, likely, sometimes it's more than that. You're not uh, required to use the Sheriff's Department. You can also hire a legal process server. There are companies uh, in town that will do much the same uh, function as the Sheriff's Department for a fee again, and they're uh, usually pretty consistent. What comes out of that service 
process is an affidavit of service, which we must see before the case uh, progresses to a uh, trial. The Sheriff's Department uh, generate, uh, or the process servers will generate an affidavit that will describe exactly uh, who was served with the documents, when and where, and at what time. The uh, court rules and the statutes of the state of Washington allow that a household member, uh, sufficient age, uh, can accept substitute service on behalf of the uh, defendant. Uh, that does happen uh, frequently, or the uh, defendant themselves. You're not uh, required to hire a process server if uh, an individual is willing to perform that function for you. Uh, they can sign an affidavit as well. We have a form for that. We have a form for almost everything. But uh, they must describe with some specificity uh, who was served and exactly where, uh, date and time, and that, that becomes part of the uh, court record. Uh, and you can make whatever arrangement you like with that individual, private individual, to do that for you. The uh, statutes require that that person uh, is not uh, a witness in your case. They must be an adult, uh, at least 18 years of age. Uh, I usually require as well that they are not an immediate family member. So uh, they do have some uh, independence, but if they're willing to do that, you don't need to hire a sheriff's department or a process server to, uh, to put the documents in their hands. There is a way to serve by mail as well. This gets a little tricky. Uh, you can use certified mail with return receipt requested. If you utilize that, uh, that way of serving the defendant, we must have a signature of the defendant that comes back on the little green card that the Postal Service will send back to you uh, that acknowledges receipt of the, uh, the complaint and again, the mediation hearing date and time. Uh, as you might imagine, many times people refuse to sign those and you may well have uh, proof that uh, the mail was sent, certified mail, but you don't have the, uh, the signature. Uh, without the signature, it is not completed service and we would have to talk about uh, going back to uh, square one. That first uh, hearing data described, again, is uh, for mediation. Every Monday afternoon, we uh, call a number of cases where both parties are present. Uh, the defendant has been served, is aware of the, uh, the hearing. Uh, we enlist the Dispute Resolution Center. They have some trained mediators who will then take both parties outside the courtroom uh, with COVID, uh, that gets uh, to be a challenge as we uh, have to use a little bit bigger room and it's a little, uh, uh, a little uh, challenging to find uh, enough places to, uh, to have a breakout session, if you will. The mediators are quite good at what they do and uh, they are not uh, court staff. They are trained to talk to the parties, talk about uh, the nature of the dispute, uh, what uh, can be done to resolve the case with a settlement short of the matter going to trial. And I will tell you, I heartily encourage settlement. Uh, it is uh, in everyone's best interest if there is some meeting of the minds, some way to resolve the dispute amicably. Uh, when there is a resolution, uh, oftentimes there is a uh, an agreement on a payment schedule uh, or some other uh, resolution that involves either the entry of a judgment pursuant to the agreement the parties have uh, come on or uh, sometimes a resolution would involve an actual dismissal of a case. Again, the mediators are well trained in uh, uh, reaching that, uh, uh, that type of resolution. We like to see that. Uh, because it saves, quite frankly, time in court, uh, a setting for a trial that we could use for another case. COVID, again, has been a real challenge in how we handle court hearings generally, and uh, 
Small claims trials is no exception. Historically, I would hear four small claims trials a week. Those are on Monday mornings. Now we're limited to three. We try to space them out uh, 9, 10, and 11 o'clock in the morning so that uh, we have some social distancing and limit the number of people that we have in the uh, courtroom at any given time. Uh, because of that, we are currently setting trials as far out as May. And so uh, there is a bit of a wait. Uh, there is a trial setting. So I certainly encourage folks to take advantage of the uh, expertise of mediators and see if we have a uh, resolution short of that. A number of folks uh, will come to the mediation session without the other party. Uh, the defendant may have been served and is aware of the hearing and appears, and the plaintiff does not appear. Uh, if the plaintiff does not appear, the case is almost always dismissed with prejudice. And that means it cannot be filed again unless the plaintiff brings a motion and comes back to court and explains what happened. There was a flat tire or some other emergency that prevented them from appearing on time. Uh, I will hear those motions on Monday afternoons as well. But usually, if uh, the plaintiff is not there and we have not heard anything, there hasn't been a motion to continue, the case gets dismissed. If the defendant has been served and does not appear, uh, quite frequently, a judgment will be entered at that time uh, in default. That means the defendant has not appeared and responded to the complaint. When that occurs, I will hear some brief testimony from the plaintiff. Uh, there still needs to be some uh, basis shown for the, uh, uh, the request, the complaint, some basis for the entry of a judgment. I do spend uh, quite a bit of my Monday afternoons uh, hearing those cases as well. So if you do come into uh, to court the defendant uh, with a claim and defendant has not appeared, uh, there may be some brief testimony that I will hear from you uh, about your case. I will ask you to, uh, to tell me about it. Now, if there is no resolution uh, through the mediation process, despite uh, best efforts, the case will be set for trial. Again, Monday mornings. Um, I do want to back up uh, before I forget about it. With uh, the mediation process, uh, the mediators will only meet with the parties themselves. Uh, I do see uh, people bringing their witnesses or other uh, folks uh, for support and uh, I'd really like to discourage that in these days of COVID. Uh, we have too many people in the, the courtroom if we uh, do that. Uh, and the mediators don't hear testimony. Again, they are there for a specific purpose. They do not hear testimony. Uh, they are uh, facilitators of negotiation, if you will. Uh, there's no testimony taken at the mediation hearing. So uh, you do not, uh, you should not feel obligated to bring uh, the folks that you would call as witnesses or provide other information on your small claims action. Uh, for the most part, there would be some exceptions. For the most part, there just is, is no need for that. And uh, we like to, again, minimize the numbers these days in the courtroom. But uh, if the parties go through mediation, uh, they're both uh, present, able to participate in that. Uh, there is no uh, meeting of the minds. We will give them a trial date at that time. Those, as I mentioned, uh, are Monday mornings. And uh, I'd like to talk about uh, how those uh, trials are conducted. As I mentioned at the outset, the small claims process is informal. There are no attorneys involved for the most part. There are some important exceptions to that. But uh, yeah, part of the uh, informal nature, the quicker resolution of cases would involve the parties themselves explaining their positions and uh, presenting evidence uh, directly to the, to the court. You can bring witnesses for that trial. I will place them under oath as I will place you under oath and uh, hear your uh, testimony. 
Uh, evidence uh, can be admitted at that uh, hearing as well. Uh, most of the time that involves documents, if there's a contract uh, or agreement that's at issue, uh, if you printed out uh, photographs, uh, emails, if those are relevant, uh, the court uh, will admit those into evidence and then consider them in uh, deciding the case. Um, if you do uh, bring uh, witnesses, uh, I will ask some questions myself. Uh, but make sure, I will make sure that uh, they are able to uh, cover uh, whatever topic, whatever information you feel is uh, necessary in the presentation of your case. Small claims are civil in nature. That means that the plaintiff always has the burden of proof. You have to prove the case by a preponderance of the evidence, just as in any other civil lawsuit. The order of the case, again, while uh, rather informal, is uh, usually this. The plaintiff will go first and explain their case, any other uh, testimony or evidence. When they're finished, the defendant has a chance to respond uh, in kind. Whatever they feel is uh, relevant uh, can be presented at that time, any evidence. When they are finished with their presentation, the plaintiff has the right of rebuttal. Usually the last uh, testimony, the last comments uh, I will hear will be from the plaintiff. Now, it's not always that orderly. Sometimes uh, I think of questions and I may ask uh, more questions of either party and so I might invite uh, further comments. Uh, please understand that uh, I am an impartial uh, trier of fact. I am not uh, uh, cross-examining any party. I ask questions only if I feel it is necessary for me to understand uh, what has occurred, understanding what your case is about, whether the plaintiff or the defendant, and just uh, trying to, uh, to uh, make sure that I understand before uh, deciding. Sometimes it happens, uh, especially these days when the trial settings are so far out that the parties uh, may resolve the case after mediation. Uh, I certainly would encourage uh, parties if that uh, happens to uh, let us know. If the plaintiff uh, no longer wants to pursue the claim or has been paid in full or is otherwise satisfied with the response from the defendant, we have a form for that and you can take care of that at uh, the windows of the Civil Department, they're windows C and D in the Yakima County District Court. Just saying, I no longer wish to uh, pursue that. That's always appreciated because then we have a, a slot that would open up again for uh, other parties. As far as the trials themselves, uh, better preparation, of course, is always uh, appreciated. Uh, Manila folder, if you have a number of documents or even a three ring binder, I really appreciate because it's easier for me to access the, uh, the documents. I want to make sure I can act, uh, get at it uh, easily and uh, should be presented in a form uh, that uh, is persuasive. And uh, uh, that, that, that would save me a, a lot of time as I go through it later. When there's a lot of documentary evidence, uh, that uh, will take some time to consider, I will uh, frequently take the case under advisement. In other words, I won't render a decision at the end of a trial. Uh, I do uh, sometimes. Other times I need to uh, have some time to, uh, to read through everything that's been submitted. There just is not uh, the luxury of time while I'm on the bench uh, hearing the case to fully absorb what, uh, what you would like me to see. I uh, try to keep my decisions uh, inside of two to three weeks. Uh, and then I will write a, a short letter explaining what I considered and uh, what I've decided. And then the judgment uh, that is entered by the court will be included with that. Uh, I do that uh, frequently in all fairness to both parties. Uh, I want to make
make sure that I haven't missed anything and can fully uh, consider the, uh, uh, the documents especially. Photographs, um, it is preferable in my opinion that you print them out. Uh, if they're color photographs, we have uh, fairly decent color photocopiers now. Uh, prints even better. Um, black and white, really bad uh, photocopies, uh, of course, may lose a lot of their uh, importance uh, as they're uh, copied in that fashion. Uh, lately, we've had folks who presented evidence on thumb drives, and that's really problematic. I'm only speaking for myself. I cannot put a thumb drive into my computer until it's been tested by our technology people so that we don't have viruses introduced into our computer system. And that uh, does uh, lose a lot of the, uh, uh, the impact. Uh, if I can't look at it and consider it with you uh, present, with both parties present. There are exceptions to that, of course. Uh, sometimes we uh, have videos and if both parties are in agreement, uh, I have had uh, those uh, entered into evidence and I've looked at the videos later. But as you might imagine, uh, if you're not there showing me the video, it may not have the same impact. If you have it in that kind of format, bring a laptop or a tablet uh, with you. Sometimes we've even done phones. If you have videos that uh, you want to have presented, but ideally, it would uh, play out in this fashion. You would have the laptop, you would show me the video, say, this is what I'm talking about, Your Honor. Uh, this is what I want you to consider. Then we can take the, uh, uh, the thumb drive or whatever medium it is, if it's a, a CD, that's introduced in evidence. And then if I need to see it again later, uh, we can have that checked out. But then you have the presentation in live court, the other party most importantly, is present and can respond to that as it is played. So, some device with you if you wish to present uh, that type of evidence and then uh, uh, it really facilitates, I think, the full impact that you, uh, that you want it to have on the court. Understandably, there are hard feelings in a lot of these cases.